everybody, it's Tyler here at IRI, checking team number 1746 Ottawa. Absolutely fantastic season for Ottawa this year. Peachtree champions and Noon Division champions as well. Ottawa's been one of those teams that, you know, over the last few years just kind of keeps rising up and up a little bit more and culminating this year with a fantastic performance. Let's take a look at Ottawa's robot, what they have to offer. Love the overall packaging this robot has. Uh, we're going to be talking about this little uh, structure here, which is going to be quite interesting. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of the custom features that they have. Of course, their intake, their arms, some of the programming. Let's learn more about Auto and what they have to offer coming up here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in first scholarship. Scholarship applications will open in September. Get ready to go pro and get more information at kettering.edu slash first. Vincent, let's start off on your robot here, uh, talking a little bit about Swerve, and then we're going to go to the elevator of your robot. Tell me about some of the features and functionalities of it. All right. So with our Swerve, we decided to go with just normal MK4Is. Uh, as you can see, we haven't really done much modification to them other than just simply greasing them up over the season. That's pretty much been all we've done. That's pretty much been all we've done. And uh, for the most part, we've kept them completely stock. Uh, we're running just simple L1s, uh, and that's just because we have a 124-pound robot. So I like to have a lot of torque for that defense. But, uh, but anywho, uh, moving on to elevator. So this elevator may just look like a normal ThriftyBot elevator. However, don't let it fool you. It's actually a ThriftyBot-inspired elevator using one-by-one. One. So these guys here, they are custom uh, based on ThriftyBot. Uh, bearing blocks that we designed in-house and along with that uh, we had them designed by a machine shop outside. So Parker if you don't mind showing us just uh, what elevator looks like going up high. So this elevator is continuously rigged. Uh, the belt that we have in here is a 15 millimeter width uh, HTD belt. Uh, along with that, it is 17.5 feet long. So this guy only weighs about 16 pounds and along with that it's fairly quick, as you just saw. Yeah, obviously, going going by real quick on it. When you looked at uh, design-wise, uh, you said you took inspiration from ThriftyBot. So did you start with the ThriftyBot elevator and, and iterate from there? Or how did you exactly come up with that concept? So for the first revision of our robot, we were extremely tall, <laughs> very, very tall, uh, about four feet tall. And lo and behold, we learned that having a bunch of weight up high did not work well. So in order to get around that issue, we decided to go with one by one tubing. This is pretty much all uh, just very thin wall. It's just 16th uh, inch aluminum. And we went with that mainly because way too much weight up high. And since the normal 30 bot kit comes with these two by one bearing blocks meant to go with two by one, we figured that it would be best to move to one by one for that reason. Thomas, let's talk about the uh, wrist and the intake uh, that you have uh, on here as well, too. Uh, you know, design-wise, using a lot of polycord I see uh, on it, but talk to me about uh, what's gone into the uh, wrist functionality of it, uh, and then any uh, demos you want to show off, like intaking a cube or anything like that, too. Yeah. All right, so our um, intake is inspired by the 111 intake that is more popular among uh, some other teams. Um, I can't really name any right now off the top of my head. but. Um, we went with this intake because we saw after our first competition how reliable it was with 111. Um, so we saw that they were Open Alliance team, um, and we, uh, I guess we took some of their um, uh, dimensions, and we figured that they would, or they also said that you had to use the orange belt, so we took the orange belt as well. Um, most of this intake is inspired by 111, but then we also have a 1339 inspired wrist. Um, with a Falcon going to a 5 to 1 gear reduction, I forget what this is, uh, going into another chain reduction, which allows a lot of torque for our wrist, um, and it requires the motor not to stall as much when holding it out. Um, overall, it's a very reliable intake. Um, it takes a lot of driver practice to get it to work the right way. Um, if we can demonstrate it picking up a cube now, so that would be our um, intake from the slide substation or single substation, where we will go flush against the wall and have our human player drop or um, drop or slide a cone or cube in. Um, we can show a cone now, where it'll just suck it in. It's not coming out until he or the driver releases the um, 
or drop button. And so it allows us to accurately place it on any of the uh, poles. Other than that, it's a pretty simple intake. Um, worked pretty reliably. We haven't had anything break. We've had custom uh, CNC uh, polycarb plates as well as a bunch of 3D printed parts just to hold it all together. So that's pretty much it. Well, Rohan, there's a lot of programming that goes into this robot to make it happen. Talking about some of the uh, different uh, uh, sensors, uh, different uh, programming features that are being implemented on this robot, and uh, let's dive a bit more into it. Yeah, sure. So the name of the game here is PID Control Loops. Um, essentially, in our entire bot, most of it is controlled by PID Control Loops. So first of all, um, if we take a look at this elevator here, uh, Parker, you want to bring it up for a bit? All right, as you can see, the elevator is not only holding position, but the arm is also holding position. And the way it gets to this position is using a PID control loop that we uh, had to tune over time. And so that's something super cool about our bot. Um, something interesting about the elevator, since we don't have a lot of weight, the tuning actually didn't take a lot of time. So that's something on the design part that was super helpful for us. Um, the arm, on the other hand, was a different story. As you can hear, it's kind of squealing here. <laughs> um, it was. It took a lot of time to tune, especially because of this beefy falcon. And so, yeah, that was some of the cool PID control loops with our robot. Moving on to some of the other features, we have a beam brake back here. Uh, I don't know if you can quite see it, but um, essentially, when our elevator comes back down, in order to keep from stalling the motor out, we have that beam brake basically stop the entire elevator. Um, it's, some, uh, it's something that uh, truly helps a lot and we've had major issues in the past where sometimes it does stall out and so that beam break is super helpful there. Um, moving on to some of our other programmatic uh, efforts, I would like to talk about our autons. So um, if you would notice, um, we are not using vision a lot in this robot. Um, we, don't, we originally used a lot of limelights but currently we don't have a lot of vision. But we used um, the software of PathLaner in order to make our autonomous paths. And f lo and behold, through a lot of tuning, we were able to get it to work without vision. And that was something I thought that was super interesting about our programmatic efforts this year. Yeah, I think that's a really th uh, important thing to point out, too. You're, you're an Einstein you know, caliber team right. that's been in the field that's using essentially minimal amounts of any sort of that vision or programming on that side of things. Uh -huh. And yet you're still making it that far. And you're right, iterations are what make it happen all the exactly. way it needs to go. So uh, the one thing I'll ask you is, uh, you know, for other teams who maybe uh, don't have the resources to do vision or, or also like you chose not to go that route, what advice do you have for them uh, looking at future years? So in the future years, I would say that um, it comes down to a lot of tuning, but there are ways you can make it work, um, especially with the new April tags that are coming out. They don't need to use those beefy limelights. Um, we can use webcams. Originally, we kind of experimented with that. It just didn't really work out. But I would say some good advice is to keep looking for options out there just to try to find um, better ways to uh, use vision in your autometry. Parks, let's wrap up on this robot. Talk about, I think you called the Cuba put uh, on here, so we'll hear more about uh, what you're using for that. Is this something that's just used uh, during autonomous? And uh, kind of break it down for me. Uh, yeah, for sure. So uh, this is the Cuba pult. Um, it, we were starting off in autonomous, and we realized that we were trying to hit that three-piece, um, and we, with having to do that spin at the beginning, we were kind of getting caught by that autonomous cap with the time limit. Uh, so we decided that a back shooting um, cube would be the best way to go forward with that. So we have a simple over center linkage. Thomas, can you set that up? Uh, just an over center linkage uh, where basically you just put this cube on, and then as soon as the servo on this back side of the thing triggers, the cube goes flying into the top node, and then we can continue our autonomous path without having to make that slow turn. Well, I think it's really interesting you're going on the top node. A lot of teams I've seen are just done something like this or are just aiming for a low one. How accurate are you with that? Um, as long as, uh, so you can either go for the top or the low. Um, it depends on which Auton we're running. Um, so when we're going low, we haven't missed it in a very long time. Uh, but when we're going high, uh, it, it also hits most of the time if you line it up correctly. Uh, putting it diagonally on top of the cubipult like this uh, actually helps make it stay in the node. Uh, we figured that out through a lot of experimenting with placement and um, yeah. 
Well, Otto, congratulations, first off, on a phenomenal season. As we mentioned, uh, division champions, also uh, DCMP champions as well. Uh, you know, things are only looking up for your team, and I can't wait to see what you bring next year. And, of course, good luck here at IRI. Thanks a lot, guys. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in first scholarship. Scholarship applications will open in September. Get ready to go pro and get more information at kettering.edu slash first. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.